o'clock. Good morning. good morning. I love the energy here. So good morning and welcome to the Congregational Church of Pinehurst. If this is your first day with us or your 20th year with us, we love to come together. We love to worship and we love meeting new people. So welcome everybody. Um, Phil is not here because he's on a well-deserved vacation. So we're wishing him and Stephanie a week of relaxation and spiritual um, renewal so um, but he'll be back he'll be here excuse me uh, next week so um, I'm wondering if there are any announcements other than we do have coffee hour today yeah Kathy hopefully you have read the e-blast this week but I wanted to make sure and we'll keep reminding you that on August 9th at 6.30 here at the church, um, the Nielsen family is offering again. This is Garrett this time. Garrett, who is a solar energy in the solar energy technology office of the U.S. Department of Energy. So he comes with incredible expertise. And during his family vacation, he's agreed to present to us sunny days, solar energy today and in the future. Um, we, as Mission, Peace, and Justice, have encouraged um, or kept trying to keep to the forefront the idea of solar energy for the church, and for obvious budgetary reasons, that hasn't come to fruition yet, but we're, we're always hopeful. But I think, too, that Garrett offers um, some incredible information for, for us as individuals, too, in our homes, as a way to reduce our carbon footprint. So it's not this week, but the following week, but I'm going to keep reminding you so that I see you here then. Thank you. Yeah, and he wants you to come with your questions. He'll speak for a short while, but he really wants to know what you would like to know. So um, are there any other announcements? If not, then let us please rise and join together in our affirmation of community. Our loving God gathers us from the east and the west, from the north and from the south. The Holy One is in our midst. God's presence is felt. Our loving God responds when we cry out in our time of trouble and eases our distress. The Holy One is close at hand. God's compassionate love encircles us. Our loving God knows our true selves. The Holy One is with me. Okay, I'm going to offer a short prayer and then we will remain standing and um, join in our. I got the right order here. <laughs> something seems well, up. Right. Yeah, okay. Let me just know. Let me just, sorry. <clears throat> wasn't the affirmation of community I was quite expecting. So uh, let us do this. Uh, John, do you want to come forward and do our call? To, um, why don't we have our, our we prelude? Just did it. Yeah, that was the we call. Just did uh, okay, the that was the call where I thought so. Okay, so that being the case, uh, you can uh, sit down and we'll enjoy our prelude. <laughs> 
Let us pray. Holy love, we worship you as your people. You tether us to you in righteousness and covenant. Reveal your face to us. Let us see you in our midst, 
in our neighbors, in strangers, in ourselves. Clothe us in love and compassion and continually fashion us as your people, for you are our God. Amen. If able, please rise and let's join together in our hymn number 322, A Word of God Incarnate. We'll join together in our prayer of transformation and new life. Please join with me. Gracious One, you have been to us together wonderfully. You have promised your abiding presence in our lives and have guided us with love. Still, we turn away from you towards the enticements and rewards of cultural violence, sometimes placing them before you. We judge our neighbors too quickly, too harshly, as others do, because it's easier than the loving or serving them. Amen. The God of mercy looks upon you with love and hope. The holy guides us when we wander onto divergent paths and nourishes our desire for newness of life. In God, grace abounds freely, abundantly, and extravagantly.
Shelby. So, good morning, but you know, yesterday at the farm, there were some senior sheep, and I think they were eating something. And then, one of them said, these it, it, idioms are really good. Have you ever eaten an idiom? An idiom? Uh-huh. No, no. Uh, well, Shelby, an idiom is not a type of food. An idiom is an expression, and the words don't mean what they say. Okay, so here's a good one. Um, I have butterflies in my tummy. Butterflies in your tummy? Well, it doesn't mean that I actually have them inside of me. It means that I'm nervous. Mm. So here's another idiom, which is, um, oh, I know. It's raining cats and dogs, which means it's raining heavily. Ah, it's silly. Well, Idioms are silly, but you know, every language has its own idioms. But the thing is, Shelby, is if you were to travel to a foreign country where they speak a language that you don't know, if they use an idiom, you wouldn't know what they're saying. So I found this Japanese idiom, which is, help, my cheeks are falling off. Now, if I said that, what would I be saying? Oh, you're getting old? Shelby. <laughs> Shelby, no, no, no. It would mean that this food is so delicious that I can't stop eating it. Where's Mr. Donkey? Mr. Donkey, Olive, you mean? Olive's at home today, but she'll be back. Yeah. Won't that be nice when Olive and, and Shelby can be together? Yeah. Okay, tomorrow, that sounds like a good plan. So anyways, I was telling Shelby that there's another idiom from Italy, and that one is, is not every donut has a hole. I know what that one means. That means it's not perfect, but eat it anyways. 
Well, that's a very good translation, but the actual translation is, is not everything comes out as we expect. Wow. So here's the thing about idioms in the Bible. Jesus spoke Aramaic, which had idioms, and it got translated into Greek, which has idioms, and then that all got translated into English. And so what happened was that when the translations took place, it's quite possible that some of Jesus' words didn't make it into the Bible because they were just too silly or too hard to translate or got lost in translation. Oh, okay. So, are, so you know what? I kind of think that idioms are confusing. It would have been a lot easier if an idiom had been like, you know, a zucchini, a cucumber. Well, that's right. So are you ready for prayer? Okay. But before we have prayer, I just want to say, Shelby, you rock. Oh, is that an idiom? I know that one. Thanks. All right. Okay. Let's, let's have our prayer. God, you created us with all kinds of languages across the world, each with their own words, cadence, colorful expressions. But across all languages, there are the phrases which are, God is love, Abba is love, Allah is love, Spirit is love. May that love be a force that unites us, regardless of our language and cultures. In this we pray, and oh, in Jesus, you rock. Amen. Well, very good. Shall we go back to our seats? Yeah, we get to sit up front today, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Very good. <laughs> hey, yeah, Naomi. Naomi, she wants to give you a little kiss. Can she give a kiss? The first gospel reading is a partial reading of the prodigal son from Luke 15, beginning at the 11th verse. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the wealth that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant region. And there he squandered his wealth, desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the region. And he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that region, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned before heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him, and he kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, 
and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. That has to be one of my favorite stories. Second scripture lesson this morning is taken from Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21. Then Jesus told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Third scripture lesson from Luke 15, 8 to 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. May God bless the hearing and understanding of his holy word. Many decades ago, my grandmother traveled to Hong Kong. She recalled passing by a tailor shop with a sign out front that read, Ladies have fits here. <laughs> Elsewhere in the world, a sign read, Don't just stand there and be hungry. Come inside and get fed up. <laughs> the title of my sermon is Lost in Translation. Because in translating the Bible from Hebrew and Greek to English, the initial meaning of a text can be lost. This morning, I hope you brought with you your passport and a language dictionary because we are going on an excursion to read scripture in foreign lands. As a disclaimer, when I use the word him or her, um, excuse me, him or he, it does not exclude her or she and vice versa. Before setting off for a foreign land, let's summarize the salient points of the prodigal son. The son asks his father for his share of the inheritance. He receives it and then squanders it through a dissolute lifestyle. Famine comes. Penniless, he hires himself out to feed pigs. Plagued by hunger, the son goes home where he can get some food. Embraced lovingly by his dad, the son admits without reservation that he has sinned against his father. A celebration takes place for as the father explains to the elder son, this brother of yours, he was lost and has been found. To Western eyes, the central themes of the story are the moral depravity of the son and forgiveness. The son disrespected his dad and recklessly wasted his inheritance. However, the measureless grace of his father, as a result of that, he's forgiven. The primary actors in the story are the son and the father. The overarching focus is upon the broken relationship, which is healed due, the, due to the unrestrained forgiveness of the father. To Eastern eyes, there are two different messages. First, 
In dishonoring his father, the son has brought shame. Not simply upon himself, but upon his father, the elder brother, everybody else in the household, and the village. Second, for people who have experienced the gnawing stomach pain of acute hunger and starvation, the other theme is the direness of famine. In 1941, 670,000 residents of St. Petersburg died due to starvation. Some years ago, Mark Allen Powell, a professor of New Testament at Trinity Lutheran Seminary, asked Russian students to interpret the story of the prodigal son. They acknowledged the immaturity of the boy, but what mattered most to them was the famine and God's response, which delivered the son from a hopeless situation of not having enough to eat. Moving ourselves on to Tanzania, where hospitality is highly valued, we discovered that the central premise is the lack of hospitality shown to the young man. No one gave him anything to eat. The primary subjects of the story, as understood through the lens of the Russian youth and the Tanzanians, aren't the father and the son. They include all who were negatively impacted by this devastating famine and were delivered from starvation by God. So, is the prodigal son a story about unrestrained forgiveness, shame, deliverance from hunger, or the unpardonable lack of hospitality? Cultural context matters when interpreting biblical passages. Often, we tend to overlook the fact that our cultural assumptions and personal histories are brought into our interpretation of scripture. <coughs> so do people in other cultures. Now let's travel to Thessalonica, a Greek city on the Aegean Sea. There the Apostle Paul stated, For even when we were with you, we gave you this command, anyone unwilling to work should not eat. How do we interpret this text? Quote, If a person can't eat, it's because she or he doesn't work. The issue here is wealth. In Western cultures, wealth is considered an unlimited asset, which we are free to accumulate however we might. The belief is that anyone can be wealthy if they try hard enough, right? Therefore, if you're poor, then you haven't applied yourself or you're just plain lazy. George Washington affirmed this perspective, stating, on a land like this, which heaven has blessed above all lands, why is any man hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison? Why, but through his unpardonable sloth. Conversely, in non-Western cultures like India, wealth is viewed as a limited resource. So if one person hoards all the money, there's less to go around to her neighbors. Picture a loaf of naan, sufficient to feed eight people and you're the sixth person in line. What if the first three people each take a third of a loaf? How much is left for you and those seventh and eighth in line? Psalm 52, seven reads, Here is a man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. In the West, we interpret the man as engaging in two grave sins. First, he trusts in his money and not God. Second, by doing so, he grows stronger and more immersed in his sin of greed. But let's journey to Israel and inquire of the Hebrew people. They regard this passage as describing one sin, not two. 
The more someone hoards, the more lives his wickedness destroys. Will a hoarder of cash ever come to the empathic understanding as to why a woman would sweep and sweep and sweep her home for a single coin and excessively rejoice when she finds it? Jesus reminds the citizens of Galilee that there will always be people in need. Biblically speaking, it's a contemptible act of wickedness to pile up wealth in newly built barns or stockpile cash in hidden offshore bank accounts when people all around you are in urgent need of food, clothing, and shelter. For Jesus... Earning a living and having money on hand are not sins. The sins lay in how the money is accumulated and how it's utilized. Are money and wealth limited or unlimited resources? Are dollars to be amassed or shared? Now let's head over to Capernaum where Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount Keep your language dictionaries handy. The seventh beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. To Western eyes, we understand this passage to mean that if we engage in peacekeeping, then God will bless us by regarding us as a member of God's family. But that's not what Jesus meant. The Greek translation for blessed is makarios, which means a feeling of contentment, of knowing your place in the world. Instead of assuming that God will bless us with a reward for engaging in some righteous act, it's the reverse. We are filled with makarios at the time we bring peace to our community. The blessing is contained within the righteousness of the act. And indeed, what a blessing it is when we find our place in the world, be it as a peacekeeper or whatever beneficent provider or server we, we engage in. Let's remember that Jesus' native tongue was Aramaic and not Greek. In first century Palestine, Greek was the language of ruling powers in international commerce. Hebrew was the written and studied language in the synagogues in the areas around Jerusalem. Aramaic was the language of daily conversations, especially in Galilee, where Jesus conducted nearly 85% of his ministry. When Jesus taught, he spoke Aramaic. How then might we translate some of the Beatitudes into his native tongue? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. One Aramaic translation of blessed, which I love, is ripe. It's connected with the Aramaic belief that how we breathe reveals something about our internal health. And it's true. So think back to a time when you were scared. Are you holding your breath? Or a time when you're breathing shallow. Are you panicked, anxious? Accordingly, breathing deeply <sighs> leads us to a state of consciousness and open awareness. Thus, opening our airways ripens us, taking us back to wholeness. In Aramaic, to mourn is to be in a state of confusion, turmoil, or at a loss. To be comforted is to return from your wandering or aimlessness, to be in the presence of hope. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In Aramaic it is, ripe are those who feel at loose ends, coming apart at the seams, for they shall be knit back together within. It's a different nuance to our Western translation, but equally comforting, 
equally hopeful. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek in Aramaic is not timidity, it's gentleness. It's a state of softening what's rigid inside and outside of us. To inherit does not mean to acquire property or wealth, as we assume in the West. For the Aramaic speaking, to inherit is to receive strength and power and sustenance from Ara, Aramaic for earth, and the unifying powers permeating the universe. The English translation is ripe, are those who soften what is rigid inside and out. They shall be open to receive the strength and power, their natural inheritance from the universe. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I love this one. In Aramaic, blessed can also mean delighted. The poor in spirit are those who are free from racial pride and prejudice, the unassuming ones. The Aramaic translation states, delighted are those who are free from racial pride and prejudice because heaven's reign belongs to them. For me, these translations grant us wider possibilities for understanding what Jesus meant when he spoke the Beatitudes in Aramaic. Now let's head over to Laos, where an English translation totally backfired. Brandon Ryan, a young, new, eager missionary, recalls teaching the cherished 23rd Psalm to the Kumas tribes people the closing sentence, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, was translated into, I will live in the hut of the great boss until I die and am forgotten by the tribe. The Kuzma's people were terrified by this passage. Conceptually, spending eternity in heaven wasn't the problem. But to live there with the great boss without one's ancestors was unthinkable. Clearly, that image of heaven failed miserably. It matters, doesn't it, if we read the Bible in an I culture or a we culture. Our last Bible verse takes us to Corinth, Greece. The Apostle Paul said, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? In the West, we interpret this passage to mean that each of us is a singular temple housing the Holy Spirit. And I kind of like that image. I, you know, I like it. That said, we have 80 or more individual temples worshiping today. Right? Not quite. The problem when translating scripture into English is it doesn't have a word which differentiates between you, or you, or you, and, and you. Regionally, we've come up with our colloquial terms. So if I say y'all, where am I from? If I say you guys, New York, New England, how about if I say youins or yins? You heard that one? I guess Yins is popular in Pittsburgh. For collectivist cultures like the Middle East, the passage I just quoted intends for the word you to be plural and temple to be singular. So a more accurate translation is all of you together are a singular temple for the Holy Spirit. By this translations, we're not individual temples, but together we become one single sacred space for the Holy Spirit. 
This notion of you translated as we answers the question, why go to church? Randolph Richards and Brian, excuse me, Brandon Bryan, whose book, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, is the inspirational source for this sermon, state, the spirit indwells the group in a way the spirit does not indwell the individual. Jesus would never have imagined worshiping God independent of a religious community. To close, what from these travels have you learned that will impact how you interpret the next biblical passage you read? As a minimum, Richards and Brian encourage us to first ask, what did this passage mean to the original audience? The Hebrews, the Greeks, to the Aramaic speaking. And then ask, how does this passage apply to me? I have found this journey of taking scripture to various cultural and linguistic contexts to be enriching. It has ripened me to a plethora of biblical interpretations I hadn't ever considered. Traveling this way has been a joy for me. I hope it's been a joy for y'all as well. <laughs> Amen. Let us rise if able, and we'll join together in hang, singing hymn 687. be seated. <laughs> At this time, I'm happy to take your joys and concerns that you have now. I, I will start off with two. Um, first is I heard from Dennis Safranek, and he wanted you to know that he had spoken with his daughter, and it turns out that she and her husband, Bob, and the children, Scott, who's four, and the granddaughter, Avery, have all tested positive for COVID, but they're doing well. So he would like your continued prayers for um, them. And, and that reminds me that uh, I did reach out to Ray, and um, I'm just hoping, and we should continue to have him in our prayers. He may be fine, but for anybody that you know, who's suffering from COVID, um, our prayers are with them this day. And also, I've had a conversation with Chris Dahlberg. So we haven't seen her for a couple weeks, so I'm checking up on her. And she's just had a series of little, you know, one thing after another. 
It's not COVID. Um, she's got a freezer full of food, so she says she's fine. But I just wanted to share that with you because we haven't seen her for a few weeks now. So there we are. Yes. I um, have a prayer of thanks. My middle daughter was here for six days with her partner and three kids, and I am exhausted. But <laughs> I'm so grateful that she's such a good mom. And um, uh, prayers for my birth mom. We went to see her, and she's under hospice care, and she was having a really bad day. But she, when I told her that was her granddaughter, she pointed at her and smiled. So. Prayers for our friend, uh, Shandle, family friend. She's in Wake Med with uh, uh, bleeding in the center of her brain. And they know what to do about that. She was a roommate of uh, our daughter, Bridget's. And what hurts her name again, Dave, please? Shandle? I would like to ask for Thanksgiving prayers for all the many hundreds and thousands of groups who are feeding the hungry of this world. Uh, two uh, points. One, uh, a special prayer of thanks to Robert Cox and Robert Wicker for providing us with such great music every mm -hmm. single week we get together. Thank you. And the second one is for a friend of a few of ours, uh, David Oglesby, who's going under uh, dialysis every day, um, all the way probably till September, when he's going to have a, uh, an extensive um, bone marrow transplant or transformation or whatever up in Raleigh. Um, th thank you for all of those who continue to support Annie Anderson with her driving career and, and for the article that um, was written about her. And if you want to follow the adventures of Annie, next Saturday at Big Sky on, off of Connecticut, she will be competing in a combined test dressage and cones course. Wow. <laughs> I'm asking prayers for my mother, um, who we just found out recently uh, at the age of 90, um, who has dementia and knows none of us anymore, was diagnosed with COVID for the fourth time, and they're now trying to figure out how to treat her if they can. Any others? While I'm walking up, we can wish Nancy Kenny a birthday. She has oh. a birthday. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for the prayers that people said. Uh, I'm extremely grateful. And um, I'm also so grateful for this church because the people here are just extraordinary yeah. in their kindness and their caring. Thank you. Well, you're contributing to that extraordinary <laughs> Any others? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let us all be together in prayer. There's much to be grateful for, Lord, as there are great concerns. So the great gift of having a daughter come home with family is, is just a wonderful joy. But at the same time, the same family has a mother who's in hospice. In fact, that's true for both Paula and for Gary. And so our hearts are with those whose mothers have moved on in years, suffering from dementia, and the concerns about what is their future. 
And so we journey with Paula, with her mother in hospice, and we journey with Gary, with his mother now suffering from COVID and what might be her future days. And we said a prayer for Shondell, who was awake, med, bleeding on the brain, a serious condition. And so we ask for your healing grace to envelop her and that the source of the bleeding may be discovered and stopped. And on this day, Lord, we thank you for those groups of people who are addressing the needs of the hungry worldwide. There is so much need. And we see images of them cooking on street corners and gathering food in trucks and making long journeys so that the food gets to the people who need it. They are your workers, and we are indeed grateful for them. And we also worry about those friends of ours who are facing surgery, be it a bone marrow transplant or because of cancer. Again, we ask your healing and grace upon them and also to grant them strength as they go through surgery, and recovery. But then there's much we have to celebrate. We have the joy of the music of this church that is so diverse and so wonderful. Um, we are indeed blessed here. And then we have the joy of following Annie as she begins her career as a driver and that she's developed this wonderful relationship not simply with Kathy and Roger, but her horses. It's a very special relationship that one has between a person and a horse in particular, or all animals. And then we just give thanks for this church, that we are a worshiping community, but we are a praying community. And we do care so much about each other's health, and well-being. And so, Lord, we thank you for bringing us together, for helping us find this place, this place where we feel you, this place where we know you, this place where we see you and others. It is indeed a precious gift. Lord, open us in a way that emboldens us to do what is right what is just, what is needed. Open us in a way that inspires us to explore new places, new faces, new languages. Challenge us to change where change is required and to create where creation cries out for rejuvenation and renewal. Grow in us an awareness of our own ways but also in the ways we can be your people more fully. And now we join together as one voice in the prayer that Jesus taught us beginning. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. The promise of abundant life invites us to trust God's provision and to share in those resources. We offer our gifts in the abundance given to us.
accept this gift that we give in recognition of your abundant love. Multiply it and bless it that it may benefit others from your abundance, but also from our abundance as gifts of life and love. Please join with me in our closing hymn. Number 323. from the north and the south and the east and the west. It doesn't matter where you come from or where anyone comes from. But what I say to you is go forth and embrace those in every corner of your world and embody God's gracious love. Amen. Amen.